Okay, church, they gave me the thumbs up, so if you want to stand with us and worship this morning, they have to get all this computer stuff synced up, so if you want to stand and join us this morning in worship, God is good, isn't he? Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth?
Lord, I pray right now that we would be empowered. Lord, I pray right now that you would help us to discover who you are, that we would come to greater discovery of your plan and your purpose. Lord, I pray right now that as we continue to trust you in all things, that we would come to great discoveries of who you are, and Jesus, that you would lead our hearts right now. Empower us, Lord, as we serve you. It's in your name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Um, okay. All right. As you guys know, this last weekend um, or yesterday, we weren't able to have the mobile food pantry. That will be happening at the end of this month, July, the fourth Saturday of this month. So if you guys are good with dates, know that. Um, also, um, we are currently working on creating a new Bible study. I think this time through we're going to be able to meet in person. So, um, and we're going to do our best to create like an online experience as well as meeting in person. Thank you. Um, with that, babe, you got it? All right. Just gotta... yeah. All right. We're having more technical issues, but we're streaming on YouTube today. Facebook, I don't like you. It is personal. Anyway, um, so if you are, um, if you are, well, I'll put the link up there later, but there's an online giving portal through Tithely. You can find us there. You can go back to our past videos and find us there as well. Um, if you are here, that when you, there's a basket at the back of the sanctuary for those that are here this morning if you want to give that way. Um, you're also able to sign up for our uh, Tithely account. It's free, and um, you can sign up really easy to be able to give weekly or monthly um, just by automatically pulling it out of your account and uh, giving it to us. Um, we know, you guys know, that the ministry of this church is happening as a result of your faithfulness, of your giving, of your responding. And... Um, to that, we are hugely thankful. We are hugely, hugely thankful. A uh, couple things really fast as well. I did not mention this last week, and that's awful that I forgot to. But have you guys noticed the, out, the exterior of the building's a lot more clean? Have you, did you guys notice that? Yeah, it's pretty awesome, isn't it? Um, Al, and, uh, <laughs> Al and Dennis helped to do that. Um, that huge like lift thingy was able to thingy that was able to help us quite a bit do that as well and so um thank you so much al's not here this morning but al and and uh dennis thank you so much for you guys' help in that also if you guys notice there's like i don't know if you guys notice these things there's two new lights at the back of the building that's lighting up the place really good there actually it lights up the backyard as well as you guys know there have been some bears around some bear activity and um it's really nice to know in fact um, never mind. <laughs> there, there have been people that have, like, randomly stopped at our house. We've actually had people walk out of the woods. It's not happened for, like, a long, long time, but people walked out of the woods and said, hey, can we uh, pitch a tent in your backyard? No, you can't. Um, it's happened. Anyway, so it's real nice to see, be able to see around you when you're walking out and about. So, uh, Jim and Rich, thank you so much for helping with that. Um, huge. I know it took a while <laughs> to get it all accomplished, but you guys got it all accomplished. I can't thank you enough for those who are responding, those who are serving, those who are helping our church do what it needs to do. So I am so distracted right now. I'm going to pray and ask for God's help as we jump into this sermon series. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness and your work within us. I pray, Jesus, right now that we would experience something wonderful as we give ourselves to you in this new uh, series, Lord, through the book of Proverbs, that we would 
discover more, that we would become more wise. Not just knowledgeable, but wise. Lord, lead us as we respond to the word. Lead us as we respond to the gospel. Lead us as we allow your spirit within us to empower. It's in your faithful and loving name we pray these things, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So, we are starting a new series in the book of Proverbs, okay? And we're going to be talking about practical wisdom. Now, this is just kind of like an introductory. We're going to talk for a few minutes about why we need to look at the book of Proverbs and why we need to um, understand what Scripture says and understand what God has designed for us and understand how to engage society, how to engage this world, because we are living in such a complex and difficult time. And there's all this information out there, all this perspective, all this wisdom, all, this, all these ideas. And a lot of times they're creating nothing more than confusion and frustration. Confusion and frustration. If you look at the Cambridge Dictionary, you will see that um, wisdom... Wisdom literally means, okay, the ability to make good judgments based on what you have learned from experience, all right? Essentially, knowing what to do with what you know. Knowing what to do with what you know. We know a lot of things, okay? I was just looking at my uh, phone this morning, and you can ask, all right, you can ask your phone questions, just like random questions, okay? Now, I asked my phone this morning, I just said, this is interesting, but I said, random fact, okay? Give me a random fact. This is a terrible random fact, but I said, give me a random fact. And this is what it told me. It says, when George Washington ran for Virginia House of Burgesses in 1758, he brought voters half a gallon of rum, punch, hard cider, and a beer for every vote. He won the election. That's awful, right? But like, you know that you can immediately, you can just say to your phone, all right, say to your phone, give me the definition of this, or do this equation, or um, tell me this information, and immediately, it's right there. Like, you can get it immediately. Now, I know that you can trust everything on the internet. Okay. I, know, I know, I know that you can, you can, but, but we are living in a society where we have information at our fingertips, and that information is constantly coming at us. It's constantly being brought to us. And we have all these thoughts, these ideas, these perspectives, but knowledge is just that, knowledge. I know this sounds terrible, but a friend of mine once said, I know a lot of really um, smart, dumb people, <laughs> or some educated, there it is, educated, dumb people. I know that sounds really terrible. I didn't practice wisdom in just saying that. But, like, there are a lot of people out there that know a lot of things, but they don't know what to do with a lot of things that they know, okay? Like, it's one thing to know that when a neutron strikes the nucleus of an atom of the isotopes of uranium-235 and plutonium-239 that causes the nu nucleus to split into fragments in the process of releasing a massively powerful burst of thermal energy and a chain reaction of that energy. Atomic bomb, right? It's one thing to know how to do that. That's something to know. That's it's one thing to know how to do that. It's another thing to know what to do with that. Science fiction writer um, Isaac Asimov, who wrote I, Robot, and many other great novels, said it this way. The saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. All right? Science gathers knowledge faster than, um, faster than society gathers wisdom. We have the knowledge and the technology to genetically edit human life in the womb, but we aren't even close to having the wisdom of knowing what to do with that, okay? We 
have the knowledge to create a highly sophisticated digital gaming environment which 200 million people, children and adults, from all over the world can interact at the same time. We don't even know or have the wisdom to understand how that affects our society, how that affects the individual. You see what I'm saying? Like, we have all these highly advanced technologies, highly advanced understandings, but we don't know what to do with what we know. And we're deeply grateful. Don't, don't misunderstand me, okay? Like, sometimes Christians get a little bit or a lot bit nervous about science and technology, and they think that those things stand in opposition of the gospel and in opposition of who God is. But as far as I understand, when you have science beginning to understand or help you understand the intricacies of the human body, like, we have the technology to look inside us. And see as a baby is being developed. Look inside of us and see as the heart is pumping and moving blood throughout your body. How can you look at the science of that and say, oh, there's no God. That's, that, you know, like science, I've got it all figured out. No, to me, science helps us to understand more about who God is. More about who God is. One of my fears is that we only see the Bible as a reference guide and not a guide to life. All right, we, we see the Bible as a reference guide. Well, I'm having a hard time right now, so let me go to the Scripture and see what it has to say. Let me go to the Bible and see what it has to tell me about life and about circumstances and about what I'm going through and about all these different things. Let me go to the Bible. And we use it as a reference guide. We use it as a guide to help us in our moment, but we don't use it as something to lead us, to guide us, to direct our lives. We don't use it to show us what we should do. We know a lot of things. We are a really educated people. Now, some of us, we're not, like, we give ourselves less credit for how educated we are, but we know that there is stuff out there that we can just grab in a moment, and we can just know. You can read something. You can know it immediately. And in knowing that, it's great. You know that. But what do you do with that? Like, how do you respond to that? We know about God, right? We know his different titles. We know what he's able to do. We know that he created the universe. We know all those things. It's one thing in knowing God. It's one thing, or knowing about God, it's one thing to know of him, but to know him, all right? We need to allow wisdom to move within us. And that's what this series is going to be all about, all right? We're going to talk about the practical things of life. We're going to talk about the practical things of what it means to interact with others. We're going to talk about gossip, okay? We're going to talk about laziness, all right? We're going to talk about... Um, lust and greed. We're going to talk about pride. We're going to talk about those things, okay? But I want to start this series out with helping us understand how confused we are and how we need to get back to the very reality that it tells us in Proverbs 9.10 when it says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight, right? To gain wisdom, we need to fear God. I'm going to make three quick points here, okay? To gain wisdom, we need to fear God. We need to fear God. Now, we need to understand the context of this scripture, all right? There is an unhealthy fear of God. Just as much as there is a healthy fear, the reverence and understanding of how big God is, we need to understand that within that, there is an unhealthy fear of God. I was talking to my wife just yesterday about something, and, and it was like, you know, she, we were talking about something, and I, it was a movie or something, and, and she was talking, well, we, we didn't watch that, or when I was, we didn't watch those things, or whatever, okay? And so when we were first married, there were things that, like, no, we can't go to the movie theaters to see that. I'm not sure how such and such and so and so is going to look at us, or or we can't say those things, or we can't do those things, we can't read those things, we can't, whatever, and, and it was like this pharisaical experience that began to exist within me, I began to live out this legalistic experience, because I was scared, like, I gotta do everything right, I've gotta do everything right, and if I don't do everything right, then it's gonna mess me up, it's gonna mess my life up, my ministry up, my family up, and I lived in this place of legalism, 
And it was overwhelming. Because I was afraid, like, man, if I don't get this right, God's just going to strike me down. And it's going to be bad. Things aren't going to work out. Things aren't going to go well. However, there is a healthy fear of God. You see, this is what has happened, okay, church? This is what will happen. We need to reverence and awe who God is. We need to reverence and awe his power. We need to reverence and awe the magnitude of what he can do at any moment. We need to reverence and awe his wrath and his different emotional experiences, uh, purely angry, purely sad, all right? And, and here, here's one of the biggest problems. Because we've decided to become our own gods, we are now living in an age of consequence. Instead of reverencing and fearing God and understanding that he is controlling the universe, instead of rever reverencing and trusting God and, and knowing that we are to fear him as the mighty one, the one who is in control of all things, we have decided that we are going to sit on our own throne. We're going to do our own thing. We're going to make our own life. We're going to do things the way we want to. What have we done? We have began to gen attempt to genetically engineer life. We have seen where people have tried to clone human beings. Like, we don't even understand the beginning of all things. We don't understand how the soul is created. We don't understand what it is to be a real human being. And here we are trying to create human life. Here we are trying to decide what it means. Like, trying to decide, you know, how things are going to come into being and how things are going to exit the world. We are trying to decide when the, when, the, when the days end. Like, instead of following the rhythm of the sun coming up and coming down, we had decided to make lamps and lights. And those are great, but here we are staying up later and later and getting up earlier and earlier, or trying to, or sleeping in too long, whatever. But we have attempted to take the seat of God and do things our way. I mean, that was the decision of Adam and Eve, right? They wanted the fruit of that tree. They wanted to see truth. They wanted to understand things. And when they did that, they understood all things. They decided to take it in their own hands. And we've been continuing in that process. And we've seen what it's done. We've not been good stewards of this planet, have we? We've destroyed and we've created issues and problems. And we have lived on this planet and we have caused devastating things consequences that we are existing within because we decided we were going to do it our way. We were going to make it happen our way. It's critical to know. It's critical to know that we are not in control, that we are not in charge, that he is sovereign and he is God. Fortunately, many presume that the world is humanity's ultimate threat and God's function is to offset it. Like, like we see God in this equal status. Many in the world, how different this is from the truth of the Bible. That God is far mightier than the wor world. When we assume that the world is the ultimate threat, we give it power that it does not have. The world is not the threat. When we expect God to balance the stress of the world, we reduce him to the world's equal. As we more closely walk with the Lord, we will discover that God poses an ominous threat, all right, to our ego, but not to us. He rescues us from our delusions so that he may reveal the truth that sets us free. He casts us down at times only to lift us up. He sits in judgment of our sin and has the power to forgive us. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is the beginning of understanding of all things. It is the beginning of knowing and contemplating how this world works. It's knowing that he is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. It's knowing that he's all powerful and all knowing and all present. It is knowing that we are the creation while he is the creator. It is recognizing that all dominion, power, and authority belongs to him. That he's the alpha and the omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. To recognize that we are living within his hands. 
When in true and reverent fear, we come to the discovery and revelation of his power, the great one who holds the entire universe together while gently holding you together in perfect love, wisdom will bind itself to your heart. We have got to stop seeing ourselves as the rulers of our own destiny. We've meddled too much. The world is, and I, I say we as in I'm including us, but the world has meddled too much in the human form. Now, don't misunderstand me because there are some wonderful things that have happened as a result of sciences and everything. I'm not, I'm not downing science. I'm just, like, I feel like we've got involved with too much without consulting the creator of the universe, without realizing that he is in charge, without realizing that he is the one who created human beings. Yes, we can get into our body. We can cut away cancer. We can, um, do, we can even do heart transplants. It is a beautiful thing what we've been able to accomplish. But when we begin to decide how life is formed and how life is shaped, when we begin to attempt to genetically change the way that a human being is made in the womb, we are really, really flirting with some disastrous things. Right? We are really playing with something that we should not be playing with. We are really flirting with disaster because we have decided that we are going to take matters into our own hands. Why is the fear of God the beginning of wisdom? Because we begin to recognize that he is the one in charge of all things. He is the ruler of the universe. Why would we assume that we can become our own gods? And how have we not come to the conclusion that over and over and over again that that decision has created serious consequence? Number two, to gain wisdom, we need to ask God. I love, I love James 5 or 1, 5 and 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. It is so simple yet so profound. God loves to give us wisdom. God loves to bestow on us wisdom. He desires to be generous. It doesn't say, oh, well, he'll give you some wisdom. No, the, the book of James says it is generous. He is generous with his wisdom. I can't tell you the amount of situations and circumstances that I have gotten myself into as a result of not allowing myself to ask God to give me wisdom in the circumstance. We're scared. We're too timid in this area. We're just like, oh, I got to figure this out. I got to figure this out. I think of, I think of um, my children waking us up in the middle of the night, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know, for whatever reason, they come into the room, and they're like, Dad, Dad, Dad. You, you ever been there before? Or they're like, Mom, Mom, Mom. And then they, like, steadily get louder and louder, like, Mom, Mom. <laughs> you know, like, like, and next thing you're like, Mom! And Mom's, like, up. I don't know what it is, but every time a mom is woken up in the middle of the night, it's like there's no like, oh, hey, what's going on? It's like, <gasps> <laughs> like, what just happened, right? Especially when it's a kid, all right? <laughs> Watch myself. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Why? Because we're fear, <laughs> because we fear stirring our parents in the middle of the night, right? Yeah, well, Okay. Yes, but we're scared to stir our kids in the middle of the night. Our Father in Heaven doesn't operate that way. All right? You get up in the middle of the night, you need some wisdom, you just ask. Because He will give it to us. He is generous. He is generous. As we ask for wisdom, we are surrendering to His perfect ways. 
I want you to understand this, okay? When we are saying, God, I need your wisdom, we are also surrendering to the wisdom that he gives us, right? We're not to be blown and tossed by the wind. We're not to be, um, you know, flippy floppy about it. When he gives us wisdom and direction, like when you ask God, like, God, help me figure this out. And God says, here's, your, here, here's the truth. Here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to do. You're like, uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Like, you can't expect God to lead you and his wisdom to do something significant for you if you don't surrender to what he's telling you. Like, to go there and say, okay, God, I need your wisdom. We need to surrender to his perfect way. And when we trust God, what knowledge we do have acquired is empowered by the creator to bring his glory. Furthermore, we will have our eyes opened to new and unseen yet simple realities. You, you tracking? Okay, we're going to get into the, the simple things as we move forward, talking about laziness and lust and pride and jealousy and all those different things. We're going to jump in there, but we need to understand at the beginning stages of all of this, if we're going to figure out the complexities of this world, we need to ask God for his help. We need to look at him and say, okay, God, you are a big God. You are a mighty God. You are incredible. You are massive. You put the universe together. You blew a breath into our human form. You shaped us out of the dirt. You blew into us and created life. And then you knocked the man out. You took a rib and you made a woman. You did those things. Why do we keep getting too involved? Like, just let life be what it is and ask God to help you. Ask God to give you direction. Ask God to lead you. It's a beautiful thing when you learn and discover something, and then you ask God for his wisdom and discernment in that thing, how God empowers that thing. I can remember moments in hospitals where I've trusted and I've talked to, to surgeons and doctors and nurses who are Christian, they're like, I take what God has given me and I use it for his glory. So like, can you imagine having that wisdom, having that perspective and understanding, and then God using that, God empowering that, God manifesting his glory to the world through those moments. We cannot be scared. We cannot be timid. We have got to be brave and asking God for his wisdom. You get yourself in so many predicaments. And the beautiful thing is, you got yourself there. God's like, oh, you, whoop, whoops, you got yourself in this mess. Let's see how you get out of it. No, he doesn't operate like that. I mean, you're just like, man, I messed up. I shouldn't have done this. This is so bad. And God's like, it was just like, God, help me. And God's like generous. He's like, here, check this out. Do this. Change this. You want to talk about your finances. You want to talk about your relationships. You want to talk about your inner struggles. All those things. We're just like, God, I know that I'm teetering and I'm moving in the wrong direction. God, I'm making poor decisions and mess of my life. God, give me wisdom. And God's like, here, here's some generous thoughts. Here's some generous perspective. Here's some generous understanding. Now, I've given you this stuff. Do something with it because it's not enough to know that you what you're about to do is going to blow up your family. It's not enough to know that your lust is going to lead you to disastrous things. All right. It's not enough to know that. It's what we do with that. We know like, man, if I make this poor investment, or if I get online or whatever because I want that thing right now, I'm going to buy it, I'm going to purchase it. We don't, we know that that's greed, and that greed is something that we know about, but how we respond to the understanding of that greed is wisdom. We've got to get this right, and we've got to ask him. We've got to ask him, God, help me. God, help me. Here, here's a practical way, okay? Th th this, this is a practical way to do it. When you have a question and you're trying to seek the wisdom of God to understand it, like write it down and put it somewhere where you'll see it, okay? Write it on a sticky note or, or put it in your, your, um, your, your bathroom or wherever you're going to come across it all the time. Like, and some of us are like, oh, well, we're looking at the most big 
like scary situations of life. We're like, God, give me wisdom in, in whatever huge matter it is. But God wants to give us wisdom in the most simple of things. So don't be afraid to just put that up there and say, okay, God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Get in the Bible. Get in the good book. You want to know things? <laughs> Read the scriptures. We're going to be talking about Proverbs. Why are we going to be talking about Proverbs? Because that, as the Bible says, as it's translated, Proverbs is literally lady wisdom. All right? That woman has something to say to you, and you need to listen. And as you put that paper up there and you begin to ask God, you begin to be persistent and expectant, you will be amazed by the conclusions that you come to. And to gain wisdom, we need to receive Christ. In John 14, 6, a very familiar text, it says, Jesus answered them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the passion he, it tells us that the truth that he is the true reality. This is the most wise decision you will ever make. This is the best choice ever. Like, you know, like, and I've said this many, many times before, but some of us are like, no one comes to the Father except through me. We look at that as like a, 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 a block or, 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 you know, like an expectation or, or an ultimatum. And it is, but we forget to remember that it says, like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's a beautiful thing. His way is wonderful. His truth is wonderful. The life he brings is wonderful. Why wouldn't we trust him to give us wisdom? The best decision you will ever make is to accept Christ as your Lord. In John 14, 15 through 17, it says, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you to be with you forever. The spirit truth, or the spirit of truth, the world cannot accept them because it, is neither, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, and he lives, he lives within you. And will be in you. The scripture tells us that this is his Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's like, look, I'm going to die. I'm going to resurrect. It's going to happen. And then I'm going to be gone. And they're like, what? And then, he's, and then he's, in a whole twist of things, he's like, and it's going to be better for you. What? Like, I'm going to live right now. I'm going to die. I'm going to resurrect. And then I'm going to go into eternity. I'm going to sit at the right hand of God. I'm going to intercess I'm going to be an intercessor for you, but it is better for you. Why? Because he will send his Holy Spirit to dwell within us. As the scripture tells us, he is a counselor. He is a comforter. He's an advocate, an encourager, an intercessor, and a helper. The Holy Spirit of truth will come to us and empower us in his resurrection and ascension to heaven. Get in the Bible and read the red letters if you want huge doses of wisdom. Now, here's the truth that John 1 tells us. If Jesus was there in the beginning and holds all things together, why can't we trust him with the understanding the universe? All right? We push at the universe, and it pushes back. <laughs> Seriously. John 1, 1 through 4, the word became flesh, and the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Essentially, Jesus was there. Jesus was there at the beginning of all things. I know it's confusing and it's hard to fully wrap our minds around, but we know that he was there. Verse 2, he was with God in the beginning. And then verse 3, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. He was there, and nothing was made that, that nothing that was made was not made through him. Or like nothing was made that has been made. It, without him, nothing was made that has been made. Think about this, okay? Jesus Christ, that we choose to accept is the one who was there at the beginning of all things. He is the one who holds this thing together. 
I've talked to you guys about this before. They look at the universe in space and they're like, we don't know, but there is some like dark matter that just kind of holds it all together. Like we don't know how to define it or explain it. We can't understand it. We just know that everything's kind of held in its place. And I'm sitting here like, yes, like this is an unexplainable reality. But the scripture tells us that he holds all things together in him. All things are held together, that he was there at the beginning, that all things were made through him. Like, why wouldn't we trust Jesus to give us the wisdom that we need to know to make every decision? We have got to stop assuming the position of our own God because it is going to lead to disaster after disaster after disaster after disaster. What happens when you take the reins of your own life? You mess up. And it's going to happen even when God is in charge. It's going to happen even when we trust Jesus and his leading. But we have got to put our ultimate trust and confidence in him. We need to put our ultimate trust and confidence in the way and the direction that he is leading. It will prove to the benefit of your life every single day. You've got to wake up in the morning and say, okay, Jesus, I'm following your lead. Okay, Jesus, what do I do with my finances? Okay, Jesus, what do I do about this strained relationship? Okay, Jesus, what do I do about this hate that's grown in my heart? Okay, Jesus, what do I do about my lust? What do I do about my pride? He wants to help you. Stop trying to figure out by yourself and realize that that is only going to create more messes for you. That is only going to create more damage, more issues, more problems. He is the creator of the universe. The creator of the universe. He is the God that we should stand in awe of. A massive, powerful God. We have come up with technology and science to see some of the vastness of the universe. And some say we've barely even touched what exists around us. And God's just, it's just there. And God's just, it, it's, it's just there. When he spoke it into creation, when you look at the trees and the plants, when you look at the sun itself, and how our planet is on a perfect axis and, you know, rotation that keeps us from cooking or freezing. When you look at all of that, you can see the designer, the creator of the universe, and how powerful he is. Why wouldn't we trust him with everything? Why wouldn't we? The wise decision today would be to surrender to his way, to surrender to his will, to surrender to his wisdom. Why? Because his wisdom, his will, his way, all of those things are things that are perfected in his love. Jesus and is, God is just as much just as he is loving. And we couldn't trust him if he wasn't just. We couldn't trust him if he didn't have wrath, if he wasn't angry at times. But we couldn't trust him if he wasn't fully loving and compassionate and gracious and merciful. We have got to trust him and his way. We have got to allow the books of the Bible to speak to us. These, these stories, the, these proverbs that we are going to read in coming weeks are so simple yet so powerful. They will help you make better choices as God speaks to you specifically. But I'm telling you right now, the ultimate act of wisdom right now is to stop pretending, stop trying to be God. It's not working. And it's evident in the world around us. It's evident in our own experiences. It is not working. Trust God's direction. Trust Jesus and where he is leading Where he is leading? Three questions as we close. Where has your wisdom led you? Where are you now?
Like, you might be in a really good place, but you can reference some things that would have gone differently if you were wise. If we had asked God for his wisdom, where has your wisdom led you? Are you going to ask for wisdom today? And what for? You're going to ask for wisdom today. What for? Like, it could be everything from a decision that you're going to make with your vehicle <laughs> to the conversation you're about to have with a family member, your spouse. Like, what are you going to ask God to help you with today? Are you going to ask him? You, you better. You should. All right? It might, you know, like, going on your, your own wisdom, it might go okay. You might get there. But, like, when you rely on him, it's going to lead you to incredible places. And will you surrender to the ultimate power of uh, the wisdom of God? Will you surrender to that fully? Will you surrender to that? Again, asking God for his wisdom, trusting God's wisdom is ultimately saying, I surrender to your direction in my life. I surrender to your will in my life. Are you guys grabbing this? You guys grabbing what I'm throwing down? Okay. I know that this is kind of an overview, and we're going to get in there. We're going to talk about some simple things because we're just busted by human nature. We don't speak right to each other. We allow greed to lead us. We're, 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 we're gluttonous. Come on, guys. Let's be real. We make bad decisions, and God is going to say to us in the coming weeks, like, trust me in my leading. But this morning... It's about surrender. Stop. You are not God. And if you continue to be, it's going to be bad. And Jesus, I pray right now that we would surrender to your way. Jesus, I pray for leading. I pray for direction. I pray for understanding. God, help us to be brave enough as your book, the book that you preserved, tells us to ask you for wisdom and direction, knowing that you are going to generously and lavishly give us understanding, perspective, and the wisdom, the wisdom we need to appropriately use what we know. God, help us to reverence you. Help us to fear you. Not be afraid to hide and, and, and to cower, worried about punishment. But God, that we would fear and reverence you, knowing that you are the creator of the, the universe. And Jesus, may we surrender to you today and recognize that because you were there at the beginning of it all, and that everything is held together by you, that you sent your spirit to live within us, to give us guidance, direction. Lord, that you are the truth, the way, and the life that we would fully surrender to you. And God, as a result of our decisions today, as we ask you for wisdom, that we would come to great, amazing, life-altering discoveries. Lord, we need you. We need your direction. We need your mighty touch. Humble us. Humble us. And help us. It's in your name we pray these things, Jesus Christ. You with me? Say amen. Amen. Love you guys. Be blessed. Be encouraged. It's going to be an awesome day.